Hello and welcome. My name is Ethan Vesley Flad. I am Director of National Organizing and Interim Co-Executive Director at the Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm really delighted to have everyone here today for this very special book conversation with Reverend Dr. Aubrey Hendricks, Jr., author of many books, and most uh, recently, and what we're going to be particularly focusing on today, Christians Against Christianity how right-wing evangelicals are destroying our nation and our faith. Thank you all for participating. Um, I'm joining you today from Asheville, North Carolina, the land of the Cherokee, and um, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, for those of you who may not know, is the nation's oldest interfaith peace and justice organization, founded in 1915 uh, in this country, in 1914 in Europe, uh, FORUSA's USA's mission is to organize, train, and grow a diverse movement that welcomes all people of conscience to end structures of violence and war and create peace through the transformative power of nonviolence. So it's a really great privilege today to host this conversation with Reverend Dr. Hendricks about this book. Um, Dr. Hendricks has uh, quite a distinguished resume, as many of you know already. He currently, and I hope this, I have this right, uh, is on the faculty of two institutions, uh, both Columbia University, where he teaches uh, religion and African-American studies, as well as Union Theological Seminary, where he is a visiting professor of biblical studies um, and, a bi excuse me, Bible and ethics, and you are emeritus professor of biblical studies at New York Theological Seminary. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today um, for this conversation. And um, I think maybe one place we could start out the conversation. Uh, I don't know if this is where you'd like to root it. I, I know you wrote in the book, this was not the book that you planned to write. Um, and so I wonder if you could just frame for us what you you were planning to write. You've wrote, written several books, many of which really deal with this intersection of um, uh, political science and history and biblical studies and theology and what were you looking at and then what really compelled you to really focus on this particular topic? Well, thank you very much, uh, Ethan. Good to be with you and with all the folks of this, uh, one of my uh, favorite organizations, uh, this historic, uh, extremely important organization on in the history of uh, the justice and peace movement. Uh, just one correction: I'm I'm not in union this uh, this year. I'm at I'm at Yale Divinity School this year in Columbia, and uh, I suppose I uh, I didn't send the correct information. But um, why did I write this? Well, you know, I was asked by a um, an editor at a. Well, I'm be honest with you, an editor at the imprint that publishes T.D. Jakes and Joel Olstein to ask me to write a book about uh, evangelicalism, you know, to, uh, just to, uh, uh, a very gentle pushback or clarification. And when I started writing, I said, you know, I, I can't, I can't write that. With, I mean, I just can't do that with good conscience. And so um, I actually uh, got them to rescind the contract, to rescind it. And I wrote, started writing the book that that I knew I had to write as, as uh, you know, justice and uh, my, my faith dictates, and that is as a pushback against the, um, what I would say is the real manifest danger and evil of right-wing evangelicalism um, and its uh, distortion of the teachings of Christ and all the destructiveness that it's doing in this, in this country. So that's why I wrote it. I wrote it out of, I guess, a mixture of, of, of real, real sadness and, fear for the future and anger and outrage too um you know um to be conscious today you have to be somewhat outraged with what these people are doing at least somewhat outraged mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because um you are writing this in the context of a particular moment at some level and the book is both not at all about Donald J. Trump, and yet that uh, is imbued through so much uh, of the, the period when 
you're writing it uh, leading through the election and into um, 2021 when mm-hmm. uh, and right at this very moment today, you know, we are watching news about the continuing aftermath of that administration and January 6th and so forth. So while not getting into that, um, maybe yet, <laughs> perhaps, mm-hmm. maybe why don't you take us back even further and tell us a little bit about um, your own upbringing. I mean, you, you, your family is from both um, the Deep South. Um, you grew up initially in Virginia and then uh, moved to Newark when you were quite young and, and grew up in a uh, I think at Calvary Baptist in Newark, if I remember correctly. And what was it that, that grounded you in your um, young years and your life with your family that then gave you a context for really thinking about evangelicalism in a, in a broader sense uh, through the course of your teaching and ministry? Yeah, well, yeah, I was, I was uh, born in Farmville, Virginia, where they close the schools for five years rather than desegregate. Um, and uh, the very pious Jerry Falwell was one of the leaders in that. Um, we moved to Newark and uh, family joined the Calvary Baptist Church in East Orange, New Jersey, actually. Um, and, um, you know, I, I grew up seeing what Christianity really is supposed to be about, about love and support and, and community um, and not crass individualism. Um, and uh, of course, you know, um, African-American Christianity is different from mainstream Christianity because, you know, it's, it's always, I mean, it was born out of, uh, out of resistance, um, right? And it's never been oppositional. It's been resistant, but it's never been oppositional. Mainstream Christianity, of course, has this, uh, um, at the very least, a substratum of um, opposition, uh, you know, with regard to slavery, with regard to immigrants, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. So, you know, I grew up in a setting where it was all about community, folk loving each other, looking out for each other, um, making sure that there was a sense of some bodiness in a society, um, which, you know, was doing its best to uh, convince us that we were not, that we were nobodies. Um, and so that, that gave me a context for understanding Christianity. What I did not uh, deal with in the book, quite frankly, because um, I knew I'd get, uh, I was, you know, giving enough ammunition for folk to want to fight against it anyway. And um, by the way, there's an article in the magazine this week, it's called This Week. And uh, man, they really, uh, I've been getting a whole lot of hate mail today because they sort of mis, uh, misportrayed what's, what, what I say in my book. But anyway, um, but I, I left the church really at like early teens and I joined the, the Black Nationalist Movement, uh, actually the Black Cultural Nationalist Movement, Newark, Amiri Baraka. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, my formative years were spent in this setting where our main concern was liberation. And I was with young people. In fact, Barack was only in his thirties at the time. I was with young people, uh, teens like myself, many who um, were, 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 you know, deeply dedicated totally to, you know, mission. We were willing to, to do what, you know, to, to fight. And, um, and we had to many times. And, uh, even to, to die for what we believed in. I mean, we, it was a romanticized notion of revolution, but we were still, and that, that formed my understanding of what discipleship is and what the responsibility is to, to stand up and fight for what you believe. And so when I came back into the church years later, of course, I had, that was still deeply a part of me, those sensibilities. Mm-hmm. And, and that um, has really shaped the way that um, I, I see the church now as my site of 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 service and struggle mm-hmm. um, and that you know i think uh, permeates the, the whole book that's fascinating um i didn't uh, know that that history and just uh, i mean here we are on the verge of the anniversary of malcolm's um uh, uh, uh Birth date, or is it as assassination date? It's the twenty first. I can't remember which, but to to know that own part of your own story, particularly in the context of Newark and all that was happening uh, at at that point, um, I, I think one of the things that really uh, struck me um, 
uh, as you talk about this context of liberation and uh, and uh, the gospel um, framework around liberation and, and and love is is you you really contextualize the history of evangelicalism in this country and contrast it with what the expression is at this moment um, at what we've seen maybe maybe not just today but going back 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, I'm speaking to you at this moment, a stone's throw away from Franklin Graham uh, uh, from his headquarters oh, here in Asheville. Oh, wow. oh boy. Um, uh, you write about um, him, you write about his father, Billy uh, Graham, and just the, the modern day evangelical movement in, in, in a number of ways. Um, but so would you take us back to the, the context of evangelicalism in the 19th century and what it was then and the groundings and how that has shifted and, and what what was it that led it to make such a dramatic change um, yeah. um a yeah. century later yeah that's a, a a good question well you know um of course we know that um racism has always uh, you know permeated this this nation and uh many of those who were um uh uh well, early ethnic, where do I want to begin? I'll leave that aside for a moment. Evan, Evan uh, what's so notable about evangelicals, early evangelicals, is that um, so many of them were so pro progressive. Um, you know, they had ideas many of, of um, uh, they might have held ideas that blacks were inferior. Uh, but still, you know, so many of them were stood up for abolition. All the main abolitionists, of course, were um, um, were evangelicals. Um, we see that uh, so many of them stood up um, in very progressive ways. Um, they were for um, labor rights, for instance. Some of them actually stood for um, uh, uh, for the equality of women. Um, and so, you know, throughout the 19th century, you know, evangelicals were the, the most progressive or, uh, you know, uh, among the most progressive religionists in this, this country, particularly when, when it came to racial, uh, racial equity. And then early the 20th century, we saw them shift, their focus shift more toward um, the cities and the urban areas with the various settlement houses um, and institutional churches where they were looking out for the immigrants as the Bible tells them to do and all that. It was in, but it was uh, with the advent of the New Deal when all of that sort of shifted. Um, and it shifted this way. Um, prior to the New Deal, um, we know that gov the philosophy of government was laissez-faire, right? Um, that the government had no responsibility to look out for anybody. Um, <clears throat> Well, they saw a responsibility to look out for the rich folk and, uh, you know, the robber the barons and all those who really control the government. <clears throat> but um, FDR said he, he changed that. He said, no, we have a responsibility to look out for the suffering. And, and he shifted the emphasis from the, um, <clears throat> the, the interests of the, 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 the rich capitalists running the country um, to look at the needs of, of, of the of the needy and the vulnerable and the, you know, the poor, the unemployed and all those. And, um, you know, the big capitalists um, led by um, the DuPont brothers um, really, you know, took umbrage to that, really fought back to that. So they started the American Liberty League um, to fight back against the uh, New Deal. And they started demonizing it, calling it socialist, you know, trying to raise the specter of Bolsheviks, et cetera. That was still very, um, uh, very much in the public mind. And then they did something that was, on, from their perspective, pretty smart. They um, started um, <clears throat> bringing into their fold <clears throat> evangelical ministers to serve their interests and to stand up against the New Deal and to demonize the New Deal, like this gentleman, um, Fifield from... Uh, uh, Los Angeles. Um, he they, he started something called spiritual mobilization, which had nothing to do with spirituality, but all about mobilizing folk against uh, uh, against the New Deal and uh, against progressive um, politics. And from that point, we saw um, <clears throat> we saw capitalists gain put more and more money into these 
um, and to these evangelicals, <clears throat> these right wing evangelicals who serve their interests. And that really was the beginning of, uh, of, of the right wing evangelical <clears throat> being aligned with capitalists. But and but when we look at uh, this this present instantiation of um, of right wing evangelicalism, that really began um, and they they admitted uh, Paul Weyrich, one of the leaders, admitted that it started when Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, administration through the IRS said that educational institutions that um, discriminate, that racially discriminate as a policy are not, <clears throat> excuse me, should not receive federal funds. And, and Jerry Falwell and the rest of the, the, the uh, white supremacists had a fit, you recall, right, with Bob, the, um, Bob Johnson, uh, uh, Bob Jones University. And they admit that their movement started at that point when they supported educational institutions' right to be, uh, to be racist, to support racial segregation. And so their roots are in, um, are, are in this, 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 this vile soil of, uh, of, of racial discrimination and anti-Christianity. I mean, because that's anti-Christianity. So they talk, of, they try to act like it started with um, abortion. Um, the movement did not though, they admit it. It started to support um, racism and voila, it's still, it's still, it's still the same. They still have that, you know, we, that's why they support a, a, a sick sociopathic racist in uh, Donald Trump. You, you definitely locate it in that, that piece around the Bob, Bob Jones University and, and the framework around that and, and really pull that apart. And I wonder if, um, I mean, we have these different terms and we have um, that we can then really take on here in the context of white supremacy and Christian nationalism. And you use some different pieces here. Like, um, it, it's interesting because there was a, just a um, a major report that came out, I think, a week or two ago related to Christian nationalism, again, in, intersecting in the context of January 6th and, and what the movement uh, for um, that effort to kind of uh, take over or re um, resist the democratic election was. So I, I wonder if you could, uh, you make it take a, this thread here um, through um, through the uh, evangelicalism to um, at least white right wing evangelicalism to Christian nationalism and ultimately even to uh, there's a significant piece that you write about in the context of libertarianism and its present day expression. So can you um, piece apart those uh, elements uh, in the context of kind of politically and religiously, how they intersect at that level, um, particularly the context around libertarianism? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, if I, uh, if I hear your question correctly, I um, will say one more time what you like. Well, me are to... they one and the same, ultimately, at this point in time? What, what it, one and the same? The, um, uh, right wing evangelical Christianity mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in this country. Is that the same thing as Christian nationalism and oh. as the, the current um, um, the current expression of libertarian politics? Do, are oh they yeah, all the same or, or how would you pull them apart? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, you know, um, by Christian nationalism and uh, right wing evangelicalism, I mean they're pretty much, I mean they're one and the same. Um, you know, there's also a Christian supremacist um, element in it that in that they talk about. Uh, God want, gave us dominion over the earth. Well, it meant that God gave them dominion over the earth and everybody else, and we're all supposed to genuflect before them. But yeah, and they're, I mean, they are also, um, Kevin Cruz, uh, a scholar at, at Princeton, uh, coined the term Christian libertarianism. And it's Christian libertarianism because, as you know, Christian, is the Bible, <clears throat> an overarching um, uh, ethical tone of the Bible is responsibility, right, for community, for others. You know, love your neighbor, and we're supposed to be concerned about the common good. But libertarianism is just the opposite. As we know, it's about, um, it, it's, it, it, it's the key saying it's about liberty and about freedom, 
But ultimately, it's about liberty from responsibility for others. You know, it's just about individualism. And so that's anathema to the to the biblical witness. And, but that's why, you know, these folk um, uh, show no responsibility to the, to the society, to their neighbors. That's why, you know, they don't bother to wear masks. You know, um, they, it's like, it's like, I don't feel like doing it and I don't have a responsibility to any, anyone else. I mean, so in that sense, you know, the, um, uh, the Good Samaritan was a sucker, you know, because he cared, you know, he cared for someone else. So you see how all this comes together. So when we look at their libertarian politics, it's, it's all cut from the same cloth. No responsibility to anyone but themselves and those who feel like that do, uh, like they do. And that is anathema to what Jesus said is equal to the greatest commandment, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. So in that sense, they're anti-Christian. Their ideology is anti-Christian. And, you know, it needs to be called out as that. Why is it that um, that that language is um, yet so compelling? I mean, again, you you say that this is the the primary message uh, of of scripture. Uh, uh, Jesus says, uh, it. Jesus, right, right, exactly. So Jesus says, "Love your neighbor as yourself," and you and you ground it in the Hebrew scriptures in the context of. And I wonder, so I wonder if you'd kind of open up the the Jewish texts a little bit for us that that. That really ground that in, the, in terms of um, Zedeka and okay. um, Mishpat. But what is it? What is the scripture that um, these Christian uh, nationalists are taking and, and misappropriating? How how can they claim to to speak against that primary message that Jesus proclaims? Well, they don't. They don't even claim to speak against it. I guess it seems to me that they just ignore it. You know. Um, they ignore anything that talks about, um, uh, you know, responsibility. Um, but, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, Mish, Mishpat and Sadaka, um, you know, the, excuse me, the ethical concept that is used more than any other in, in the Bible um, is Mishpat. We translate that as justice or judgment, right? Uh, judgment in, in the sense of, of of uh, of balancing good and and evil, right and wrong, um, over four hundred times, misspot, you know, giving giving everyone uh, everyone their due, you know, as a child of God. Um, so that is the primary ethical concept of the Bible. The second most off occurring ethical concept is sort of car. We translate that as righteousness, uh, but that has a connotation of personal piety, right? And the Bible is not, is, is not about individualism. There's no word for individual in the Hebrew language at all. And so when it, so when it, um, right, righteousness is, is about doing right in society, doing right in community, right? And then what's really interesting is that the most often paired terms, ethical concepts in the Bible are mishpat, and sort of car justice and doing justice in society. You put them together, and what does that say? That's social justice. That's the primary foundational uh, ethical foundation of of our of our faith. And then, if loving your neighbor, Jesus says that's tantamount. Loving your neighbor as yourself is tantamount to loving God or equal to loving your loving God. Then um, it's important enough to to bring that to the equation. So that means egalitarian social justice. Everyone should have the same access to eat of the fruits of the tree of life, not necessarily the same ending, but the same access and opportunity. That's foundational. That's not seems not to be in their Bible. I mean, because John MacArthur, who's supposed to be such a scholar, you know, he wrote that uh, that that that. <clears throat> Some kind of paper, I forget the title, the paper that he that he issued uh, last year against uh, essentially saying that social justice is unbiblical. I mean, this it's it's unbelievable that these people don't even have a sense or have or, or care to have a sense of what the Bible is really about. So what it really comes down to, if you don't understand 
understand and don't value, don't respect the basics, um, foundation, ethical foundation of the Bible, then there's no way you can understand the, the gospel. And they don't. And that's why, you know, what they're doing is anti-Christianity, opposed to the teachings of Jesus Christ. I really appreciated uh, how you, in the book, you, you offer that framework around social justice, which again, as you say, has become this sort of uh, red letter <laughs> term or something like that now. But, um, and, you, and you take these, um, these texts and you put it in uh, there for, uh, to, to say, this, this is what the text would read if, if we use that um, understanding of what this means. Um, and I also, it was interesting because as I was reading that uh, and your, your framework around, there is no context um, of individualism in, in the way that um, these, these stories and these passages are written. And I was thinking very much about the, the, the framework of Ubuntu, um, mm. the Zulu and, and Kosa traditions. And then you name that uh, toward the very end, uh, 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 indeed uh, linking sort of that Abrahamic framework with this uh, African indigenous um, uh, theology as well that, that has been lifted up to us by especially certain voices such as um, Archbishop Tutu and other extraordinary yeah. leaders. Yeah, um, yeah, very important. Mm -hmm. it, it strikes me it, it, in this piece that you name around social justice and this sort of takedown that was attempted a year ago or so about it, um, it really ties, again, you named it, you, um, um, being from Farmville, Virginia, from this rural area, that, you, that your home state right now is one of the many places in this country that is similarly uh, trying to take down uh, uh, the, the, the language of critical race theory and and all that and and an effort to kind of really have that a, a, an acknowledgement and a faithful telling of history um, in the ways that uh, all levels of our educational system do that and so do you see that as what um, uh, right wing evangelicals are uh, very much attempting to do as well is is um, to, to really just, you said that like, they're not um, responding, they're not acknowledging certain parts of the Bible. And is that what they're trying to do just broadly with respect to our own national story? Yeah, I think you're so right. Um, you know, uh, um, they, they're trying to, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going I'm trying not to go back to to uh, Nazi Germany, but um, you know what what these folk are are trying to do. You're right is 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 a is a race history, and um, but also <clears throat> to they show that they do not want <clears throat> black people to be treated justly in this country, um, and part of that is to refuse to acknowledge uh, the extent to which that we've been disenfranchised, um, to not, not to acknowledge the way that um, our, our, our economic capital for, um, formation has been uh, so, so, so deformed and all the obstacles that, are put, um, that have been put in, in front of us. Um, and they just, they, the, and in the way that they lie on critical race theory is just, Another way of outraging folk to rage against black people, you know, um, and that's all it is. Because as you and I know, and probably everybody on here knows, critical race theory is taught in law schools and graduate schools. This is not taught in grammar schools. What's taught in grammar schools is history, American history. They don't want, they want to excise all American history that doesn't suit their, their purpose, just like the way they treat the Bible. And that's why this this right-wing uh, evangelical movement, their Christianity is ideological. It's all about their interests. Nothing counts. Everything they want to wipe away, everything that doesn't serve their interests to dominate uh, to dominate this country. And also um, that, and also they 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 cannot. They've shown no evidence that they want to move beyond um, their racism. Uh, in fact, they're embracing it more 
and more. So it's it's a it's a dangerous, dangerous time. And I don't think most people realize how dangerous this is. Um, uh, and this, these next few years are just going to be key to see how our, if our democracy survives and how many people get killed in the meantime. And I'm not exaggerating at these. I mean, you should see some of the stuff I got today, die, nigger, die, and all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, it's bad, man. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Wow. Uh, so this is um, particularly related to the piece in, that you said came out in this week. Um, yeah, it's, it's, man, you know, I mean, it doesn't scare me or anything. It just saddens me. There's so much hatred. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, they hate us just for existing. Lord. Oh, um, indeed. Um, well, I, I, I want to make sure to invite in all of our audience into the conversation as well. You're welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but mm -hmm. for those who may have a, a question for Reverend Dr. Hendricks to please either put your name into the chat um, or use the reaction function to put your hand up as a way to uh, let us know or write your question into the chat and I'll be glad to um, lift it up uh, in our conversation. Um, one of the things that um, really struck me uh, among, so I mean, you, you take on <laughs> all, the, all the headline issues. Um, I mean, you're from um, abortion and sexuality to gun violence. I mean, today was the, uh, this dramatic uh, court ruling, um, some might say, in terms of yeah. the Sandy Hook on uh, Newtown massacre and uh, the first uh, possible opportunity for taking on one of the gun manufacturers for what the the mass tragedy of so many children and uh, adults who were killed in that terrible incident. Um, so you take on gun violence, you take on different pieces. One of the one of the ones you uh, engage also is immigration, um, and um, uh, I was I found it so striking when you said that there was a. Uh, an acknowledgement um, that nine, it was, I think, a 2015 poll that had been done of evangelicals, right, uh, white evangelicals, and, and nine out of 10 said that scripture had no impact on their views of immigration reform. Um, <laughs> it's just like, you know, in terms of taking, I mean, you take on each one of these pieces and you ground it in scripture and then in the context of what's happening in the evangelical movement. So um, uh, there couldn't be any more classic element of uh, love your neighbor as yourself than the, the, the topic of, of immigration. And as you, as you just said, um, that's something that where we don't know whether in the context of Washington, D.C., whether any progress will not actually happen because of the polarization there. But could you open that up a little more for us in terms of this extraordinary, uh, particularly maybe talk a little bit about the, the dramatic shift in um, in white evangelicals, right wing evangelicals, from a period when a president Ronald Reagan says one thing about immigration, and then how significantly that shifts in a short amount of time for someone who's held up as this paragon of conservative virtue. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you know, Ronald Reagan is uh, is their their the hero, one of their their main heroes, but Ronald Reagan. Uh, uh, he supported um, immigration. Yeah, he he supported uh, the importance of, of immigration to the uh, immigrants to to America, and he was against um, uh, uh, barring immigrants into this country. But since, but um, since Trump's, I mean, Trump really started this hateful thing. Uh, he opened the Pandora's box. You know, right? He started off calling. Um, Mexicans, rapists, and murderers, and all of that, and uh, and since that time, I mean, these people uh, are 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 they have accepted his rhetoric, um, despite what the Bible says. I mean, the the ger, the Hebrew term ger, which translates strangers or immigrants. As we know, anyone who reads the Bible, particularly the Old, Old Testament, it's one of the one of the main. Commandments we get throughout the Bible is to look out for the immigrants, right? For the for the for the girl and for the orphans and for the for the widows. Why? Because 
um, you, you know, the children of Israel were, were once um, uh, were once immigrants, and they know um, the, the struggle, right? And that's what the Bible says throughout the Bible. It even says that we that one of the reasons that um, tithing was prescribed was to be able, was to have funding to help immigrants along till they establish themselves. I mean, tithing, it's, it, as, as fundamental as that was, that was supposed to help immigrants too. So, but, but we get just the opposite with these right-wing evangelicals. Um, and, and so they're pushing these policies, people like, like Cruz, who's just, I mean, how do you get, get to be more of a, a, you know, a crumb than Cruz, man? I mean, but you got people like this who are demonizing and pushing against um, immigration, uh, immigration, and and um, trying to put all kinds of obstacles up, and and portraying immigrants as murderers, and Muslims are all supposed to be terrorists and all that. That's the again, that's anti anti biblical. That goes against the Bible. So again, it, 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 I mean, one of their fundamental issues is the antithesis of the biblical witness, and. They're inculcating that throughout the um, the government on every level. It's almost like if I believe in a supernatural antichrist, which I do not, because the Bible doesn't give me right to do that. You know, Revelation talks about a beast, right? Doesn't talk about an antichrist. Um, but if if I believed in that, I would have to say that there's this. There's got to be some kind of metaphysical evil in this thing because it's it it goes so far and it gets people to ignore the very religion and scripture they they claim to believe in um and so i mean i hope i'm responding to your question in terms of immigrants um um, because the bible says throughout we should take care of immigrants and welcome them and treat them as equals and uh, that's not what right-wing evangelicals are saying at all We've got a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to go to one of them in just a moment. I want to pick up on one of the words, though, that you just uh, used. And, and uh, you talked about the, uh, the the use of Antichrist. And you you talk about that in the book. And I don't know if this that's one of the places where the, the this takedown piece uh, about you really came after you. But that's, uh, mm-hmm. again, this is, you know, you it's a hard-hitting book that, uh, in general. But that is, uh, as toward the end, you really... A look at the language of antichrist and antichrists, and, um, yeah, yeah. and what do you mean by that uh, in terms of the way you describe it? Well, you know, the only place in the in the Bible that talks about uh, antichrist is uh, in the, uh, the, the letters of John. Uh, and First John talks about an antichrist, antichrists plural, and uh, spirit of antichrist, and it defines antichrist as you know, anti means. Um, in opposition to um, Antichrist and Antichrists and the spirit of Antichrist is um, <clears throat> teaching and doing the opposite of what Jesus taught, yet doing it in the name of Jesus, right? Um, and I, what I, you know, what I show is that this is an ideology that 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 permeates their uh their movement um this spirit of antichrist or this spirit this accepted spirit of opposition to the teachings of christ in the name of christ so they they so you so you have people like franklin graham and and uh robert jeffress and you know backward guys like that um you know uh standing in opposition to immigrants and uh and uh and, and sp- using hateful language and supporting this sick, evil ex-president um, in the name of Jesus, and praying for him in the name of Jesus, and 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 saying like Paula White, like anyone who who speaks against him will be punished by God, and all of that. That's what I'm talking about when I t- say a spirit of antichrist, and I think it's it's pretty obvious uh, if if one looks at it at it clearly. So I'm not talking about anything metaphysical. I'm talking about an ideology that they subscribe to an ideology in the sense that um, uh, it serves their interests to uh, to be in opposition to the gospel, to redefining the gospel um, in, in terms of their own interests in ways that uh, that Jesus never meant it to be uh, taught. 
Thank you. Um, well, we have some really excellent questions that are coming up on the chat. So I'm going to bring forward a couple of them into the conversation now on behalf of our audience. Um, Dennis Jacobson asks you, uh, do you envision something along the lines of the Kairos document of South Africa or the Barman Declaration that might coalesce exposure and resistance to right-wing evangelicalism? Yeah, I would love to see something like that. You know, um, I mean, the, what the question raises is one of the real sad, tragic, sad spots here is that uh, you know, on the progressive side, we've not done nearly enough to oppose this this reign of evil. Um, you know, the right wingers still control the uh, uh, the, the religious slash political uh, discursive terrain. Um, so, I mean, it would be it, it would be powerful if the leaders of of major denominations would come together um, to. Uh, not just to issue a statement, but come together um, on the steps of the Capitol, you know, to, I mean, uh, the, the women early on in, uh, in Demon Trump's, um, uh, I hope you heard that, in, in, in Demon Trump's reign, um, women came together and there were, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of them. Well, why aren't we doing something? Why aren't we people of faith really standing up to them? There are pockets of them. But you know, I, I, mean, I think you're right. I mean, we need we need a statement that is written, but also maybe we should present it like Martin Luther presented. You know, go on the steps and say, "Look, this is where we stand, and we're not going to take it anymore." Um, I, but I don't see that any movement toward that right now. Um, I don't. If someone knows something, please tell me, Lord. I I, I need to hear it. I think we're going to move from that um, aspect, which is a, a fascinating idea. And I love the way you approached it and the, the putting them up on the door to uh, a different approach. A couple of the questions um, that our audience have offered really speak to, again, you know, this is the fellowship of reconciliation, right? And so how do we, uh, so that, that kind yeah. of constant tension between resistance yeah. and reconciliation, between um, truth-telling yeah, uh, some would say we, we won't get to reconciliation without truth telling. So we have to acknowledge that. Right. Um, but there are a couple of questions here um, about how how those who are coming from either mainline Protestant communities or Catholic communities, other um, uh, Christian uh, groups, or or otherwise, they may uh, be people of other faith traditions, how they can engage, um, uh, if at all, right wing evangelicals. We have. Um, one question from Andrea Briggs saying, do you have suggestions for how I might initiate conversations with evangelical leaders in my community? Yeah. And then Dwayne Katie asks, how do we get Christian evangelicals to engage progressive Christians in dialogue uh -huh. to reduce Christian nationalism? We know that it's, it's, there isn't one evangelical uh, white evangelical community. We haven't even talked about African American uh, evangelicals and the stuff within the Black Church, and, uh, which you do address somewhat in your book as well. Although your primary focus is on white, uh, but but those those contexts about like how do we reach out to um, uh, if we're not if we're not coming from an evangelical tradition? How do we reach out and and how do we invite Christian evangelicals to create um, forms of relationship? To That's us? Good point. Just want to clarify something. Um, um, in the book, I talk about right-wing evangelicals, uh, most of whom happen to be white. But I'm not indicting. I don't indict white right-wing evangelicals. I think I think they pretty much do that for, for themselves. Um, but you know, I mean, it's a good it's a good point. You know, many of these people. I would love to think it's a majority, but I I, I don't know that's the case. But there are many folk who are wrong, but they're sincerely wrong. Um, they don't know any better. Um, and so, you know, uh, we, we have to be in, in dialogue. I think one, one <clears throat> what we have in common to a certain extent in different ways, maybe, but what we have in common with them is that we both claim uh, to believe in the Bible. And um, I think that um, one place to start <clears throat> is what I tried to, to start in the 
or Christians Against Christianity, and that is to um, try to identify common ground, um, a, a, a normative core of the gospel, of Jesus' message. And of course, um, the first thing would be love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. And in the social sense, the horizontal axis, love our neighbor as ourselves, that is the, the primary um, social commandment followed. And then what Jesus, what we see that he offers um, as the primary mode of judgment that God will use against, use for, uh, for us, and then by extension, we should use for ourselves and, and uh, others in our community, is Matthew 21, 25, 31 through 46. Um, as you have, as you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. You know, as you've tried to help other people, tried to have a just society of society where people are healthy and, and have, uh, have, have decent lives, then you've done it for God. As you have not done it, you have not done it to me. And then Jesus says, then you go off into hell, essentially. Um, and that is the way that, that is the primary mode of judgment. You know, we, we should judge, we should be judged not by who we sleep with or, or what kind of doctrines we espouse or denominational stuff, but how we're living in the world, if we're trying to make a just and loving world. And if, and, and, um, if, if that is what Jesus offers as the primary core of the gospel, not John 3.16, he didn't say that, and not, nothing that Paul said. And if we... If we start there, we have something to talk about, you know. Um, the reason I wrote this book in such a hard-hitting way is because I wanted to try to raise some consciousness and raise some issues, and some things just needed to be uh, need to be shown as bogus lies. But um, the, the goal is really is reconciliation, and the only way we can we can um, reconcile is based on the biblical witness and and, to, and so when we raise things about justice, about social justice and point to chapter and verse, well, we might have some disagreements, but at least we, we're, we're in the same wheelhouse. At least we're able to talk about these things. But until we do that on, uh, on the progressive side, we're not going to get anywhere. And of course, we're not going to get anywhere calling these people backward and stupid and all that. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. But until we speak in the frame which they can understand, which is which they claim, and that is the terrain of the Bible and the, and Christianity, we won't be able to reach them. We won't be able to um, to get along with it. They're not reaching out for us, and uh, so that's. I mean, that's how I see it. I don't. I mean, I'm sure there's other ways too. I would hope, but that's the the way that I the primary you know way that I I see that it can be done. It's interesting. I mean, you write about some of the framework within um, uh, it, it, the the powerful attraction of sort of end times theology that is in some of the, the movement, and mm -hmm. how that informs a culture of fear and othering. Um, and so, um, it strikes me in terms of what you're just sharing that th the the effort to really kind of address that core piece around moving us past uh, fear um, using using both scripture and text and so forth, but uh, other ways to do that is is part of that process. Uh, that's going to be the central uh, way to, to get there. Yeah, they think we're irreligious. They look at us as just irreligious, you know, uh, uh, libertines. And, uh, and that's our fault because we're not standing up um, and, and, and speaking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking generally. I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're pockets, as you know. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a pocket right now. But generally, mm -mm, not, my denomination, African Methodism, no, uh, you know, I, I had a chance to speak to the bench of bishops recently, and, and hopefully we'll see some movement. But, you know, no, no, they haven't, they haven't, made, a, they haven't made a stand like they should. We just have to start doing that or uh, because we're losing. They're winning the battle, and we're losing the battle, and they're winning more every day, and we're losing more every day, and and we we must we must fight against this evil. It's our it's our our gospel duty. 
Um, well, we have different more several more questions here, and I'm trying to think which way to to go with them. So I think one that I'll take right now in terms of the I don't know that this is exactly on your frame of winning losing, but there's a couple of different interesting pieces here. One, uh, Magdalena Breyer uh, asks a question, and then I'm going to contrast it with a, a, um, a story that came out um, from the Washington Post uh, recently. Um, what uh, what do you believe is the underlying quote driver behind the current resurgence in white Christian nationalism? Why are movements such as those for social equity and justice, or phenomena such as globalization, perceived as existential threats to their core identities? Does it relate back to a loss of quote power and white privilege that has been maintained through and since the formation of the nation? or to broader political and social polarization and mistrust of political opponents? So that's that's the question from our audience member. And the one thing I'm going to contrast it with, maybe, and I'll, I'm interested in your perspective, certainly to that uh, fascinating set of questions. And then um, I've seen some coverage, including like a Washington Post story, as I referenced, that, that looked at a, a recent um, report from Pew that mm-hmm. said, uh, white evangelical movements are actually in decline. Um, uh, this, this, I think, came out last year and said that um, uh, Pew said that the number of uh, quote, white evangelical Christians had declined over the course of about 15 years from in the mid 2000s, what was supposedly about 24 percent of the population to uh, uh, 14.5% of the population in 2020. Um, so uh, I wonder if, if, if true, I mean, again, they have their methods of collecting data and so forth, and that maybe reflects what happened previously in the previous decades of, in terms of mainline Protestant denominations, at least white majority denominations. I can't speak to the historic Black um, Christian movements. But um, if you would talk about both this piece about, like, our, our white uh, Christian movements resurgent? Are they growing and uh, attracting more attention or are they in decline or is it some of both? Uh, and 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 her, uh, Magdalena's questions about loss of power and privilege and and what's what's leading to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that grievance has a lot, you know, has a lot to do with it, but many folk have been convinced and and. and Trump has been a major cheerleader in this. They've been convinced that they are being victimized, and that uh, that they are that they are being overlooked in America. That they're being overrun, you know, by 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 foreigners, by by brown folk who are going to take over the country. I think that's a a, a big a big part of it, um, and you know, and the insecurity when I mean, we look at. At, at the data, the insecurity has, we've seen this inse- insecurity grow since the 1960s, right? With uh, the so-called sexual revolution and all of that. Um, and um, and so it was all always there, you know, uh, but Trump opened a Pandora's box and he told folk, yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. We're being, you know, we're, we're being pushed out and blah, 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 it goes down the line. <clears throat> But even as the number of folks who attend evangelical churches decline, the ideology is, seems to be growing. You know, um, uh, the ideology, because we see it's really not tied to, to teachings of Jesus at, at, at all. And so, you know, one guy wrote me this morning all this horrible stuff and called me all kinds of niggers and talked about death and all that and said something about Jesus. And I said, oh, so you're telling me then that Jesus thinks it's all right for you to call people to terrible names and and insult insult them. And his thing was, he didn't really give a damn what Jesus said. This is how he felt, you know. And and I'm and I'm an anti I'm the antichrist. So you see, it's 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 irrational. But we also have to remember that there's always been this stratum of hateful people, of hateful racists, of of, of homophobes, of anti-immigrants. Of, uh, of, of a misogynist, and they've been given license, and they're getting more license every day, right? I mean, when you have 
I mean, I looked at this congressman last week who pushed this his, his colleague, a woman, and then told her to kiss his ass. Pardon me, but that's what he said. This, I mean, incivility is okay. It, that wasn't, wasn't okay a few years ago. And there but, was an elder African American congresswoman as well. Yes, a, a yes. I mean, and I mean, come on. It's but it doesn't matter. They just can say anything. I mean, you have a uh, Ron. Um, uh, what's his uh, Ron Paul's son? Um, the other day said, uh, you know, he he hopes that we have the same kind of problem in America with the truckers closing down the cities that they had in in uh, Canada. I mean, he come. They they don't even care. They don't. They they feel no reason to hold back anymore. So the ideology is getting stronger. They, they're getting more emboldened. And Trump and his lying um, cohort have so much to do with it. He's enabling all this. I mean, it's almost like the devil sent him to tear America apart. <laughs> if I believed in a metaphysical devil, I'd believe that. But that's what's going on here. So, you know, so, yes, it's the, it's the ideology is, is getting more pervasive even as the church is, and it doesn't matter if the, if the church numbers shrink because they still have out, um, outsized power um, in, this, in, this, in this country, way beyond their numbers. Oh, thank you. And um, we're gonna take about three more questions, if that's all right, if, if you can stay with us for another 10 mm -hmm. to 15 minutes. And, okay. um, uh, and one that I just wanna pick up on in terms of, again, the vile uh, hatred and um, language that you've received. We, um, we received a question, how do you ground yourself spiritually before confronting and interrogating injustice? I, 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 uh, it's, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, I'd, uh, I'd be rather playing, rather be playing with my great granddaughter, you know. But it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I, my father used to ask me, "Son, why can't you be like the other boys?" I'm like, "Dad, I don't know why. I wish I could. I don't know any other way. How do I ground myself?" Well, you know, I have a peaceful home. I have a wonderful wife who's also uh, who's also a writer and a professor here at Columbia, and um, you know that 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 means so much. But you know, like 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 probably everybody here on this call, um, I believe I believe in the teachings of Jesus and I believe that this is what I am supposed to do with with the um, the unlikely gifts and training that I've been been blessed with. It is unlikely that a boy from Farmville, Virginia, you know, father never finished high school. We finished high school when I was in high school, a bricklayer. And, you know, I ended up with a PH, uh, uh, Ivy League PhD teaching at Ivy League schools and all that after coming through the Black Masters movement as a street soldier. You know, it's it's unlikely. And, and I just feel a responsibility. So, I mean, how do I prepare myself spiritually? I don't know that I that I am real well prepared spiritually. It takes a toll, but I'm, I have a warrior spirit, and all I know to do is, 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 is to fight. Blessedly, though, I came through the, a Black church experience that grounds me, um, and so with, with a sense of, of justice, you notice that I was careful to make it clear that I'm not indicting whites when I was saying white evan Yeah, because, I mean, I thank God I know something about, about, uh, about loving folk, and not, and not um, um, seeing folks as enemies who have not declared themselves to be so, <laughs> you know. So that's 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 all I know to say. Um, thank you uh, for sharing that so personally and authentically. Um, and I mean, I think it, it it's interesting. You know, of course, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a movement that was founded as an ecumenical Christian movement and became a multi-faith expression of uh, those who came together, committed to the rights of conscience and resistance to war and to building um, what in the language of, of Josiah Royce and, uh, and Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King, um, uh, we think of as a beloved community framework. Um, I, I really, I, I hear this, this focus on um, 
what's happening within the church as something also to be engaged with people um, across faith lines. For I mean, we, again, we're in a, a country that is changing significantly in some ways, whether or not uh, your point about the power, the outsized power, perhaps, no matter what the actual numbers are for uh, right-wing um, white evangelicals, but the outsized power and influence that it takes, uh, particularly across lines of uh, government and other institutions in our country, and, and that with what we would name as white supremacy, the institutional inf uh, informing. Um, I, I want to pick up this question. Uh, that last question was from um, Reverend Jason Carson Wilson. This one is from Reverend uh, Jeff Curtis, who asks, it seems the, the Lutherans failed to be effective against Nazism in Germany in the mm -hmm. 1930s. Uh, are there any lessons to be learned from that experience almost a century ago uh, for what we're dealing with now when uh, people are one? So again, uh, this is my own addition to um, Jeff's question. Uh, like there's a framework around fascism arising again and so forth. But uh, what, what lessons what might we learn from that period um, to our present day situation? I don't, you know, it seems, I mean, they, we saw their efforts. I wonder if they started soon enough and energetically enough um, to, uh, to question and to deconstruct the, uh, the, the ideological hegemony of, 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 of the Nazis, you know, um, because the Nazis, <clears throat> the Nazis just steamrolled over all of, of, of the movements um, because their definitions weren't strongly enough in, um, opposed. I mean, the lesson that we should learn in this country is that this is really is a war. This really is a dangerous fight. I mean, it's not going to get better if we don't if we don't fight it. And I think that that's that's the lesson to learn. I think that there, if if if, if um, they could go back in time, if if those living under under Hitler um, could see could look could see what happened. Um, uh, what Hitler did, what eventually happened, that they would have fought much harder. I guess what it comes down to is being able to see just really how terrible the danger is. And the lesson they learn, I think, is to realize that this is extremely dangerous. And we should do much better than, uh, than the Lutherans because we know it's possible. And they, they couldn't imagine that it could be like this. Well, we know that it could. And, and still, we're not really fighting like we should. And that's the, the, the scary thing uh, to me. Um, and so, you know, when I say fight, you know, I don't mean be oppositional, of course, but uh, we, I mean, we, we have to oppose evil, but we have to expose the evil uh, much more than, than, than we're, we're doing now, you know, and not be afraid to point out that Donald Trump is an evil actor. And that he is a um, an embodiment of the seven deadly sins, and he's you know you know and he has to be deconstructed. It just has to be. Um, uh, folk have to see him for what he is because America doesn't see him for how dangerous he is. So that's I mean that's the lesson I draw from from that anyway, um, brother. I'm you know I'm I'm really really worried about what's going on in this country. And uh, I'm really worried for my, my great granddaughter's future. I can't see how we're going to have a democracy in another generation. If nothing changes, we, I can't imagine how, how, how we can. And if it happens, it's because we allowed it to happen. And that's a, that's a damn shame. I wonder if you'd close us out, um, Dr. Hendricks, with a little more on that um, in terms of uh, looking forward, both in terms of... Um, I mean, you, you've offered a very sobering <laughs> word to us right there. Um, uh, and I'm not asking you for a word of hope. That's not necessarily what we, um, what uh, what this book is about. Um, it's a it's a truth telling and so forth. But if you'd say a little bit about, particularly in this moment where we are seeing um, some saying that um, uh, 
Mr. Trump will once again be running for office and uh, and those who um, you, you speak to them as sycophants and uh, not court jesters, but court uh, uh, court uh, court of evangelism mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, are are speaking on behalf of him and in, and in his name. What you see happening uh, over the course of the next um, two to uh, five years, um, and uh, and then maybe um, in a more um, not 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 mundane at all. But what is it that you're um, writing now? What's your what is the project you're working on at this time? That's going to be what we can look forward to next. Yeah. Well, you know, I I look at at Nazism, you know, Hitlerism. Um, and sixty years later, eighty years later. Um, you know, um, it's still alive because it gives, it, it, it gives shape to, uh, to, you know, to hatred. It systematizes it, it systematizes it into an ideology. I think that Trumpism, the kind of low life hatred, um, and the justification of hatred, I think that's going to be with us for a long time. I can't imagine it's going to, to you know, to leave. Um, you know, the, the Nazi groups have embraced it and they're still around. And so the um, question is just how much um, influence it'll have, you know. Um, and uh, I'm afraid it's going to continue to have a lot of influence unless he is discredited, so discredited um, that it's that folk <clears throat> that folk don't well so discredited discredited that folks see that he's how wrong he is i mean i'd love to have a a moment like uh, the mccarthy moment when uh, uh the attorney wilson said long last have you no shame well you know um maybe that'll happen with trump um and that'll wake some people up and that'll make a difference um, but other than that, I, I just I don't see any any end, any end to it until we have a real concerted opposition. Young people are opposing it, but, the, you know, there's they're not organized. Um, you know, um, William Barber is doing a great job, but um, he's not really standing a, a, a against the dismantling of democracy. That's not his. That's not what he's doing. You know, he's looking out for the poor people. Um, you know, he's not even, you know, doing what, what King did. King, King wanted a new architecture of society, right? He, he wanted a new political economy. Well, um, you know, Barbara's not going, him going that far. So I don't, I mean, I, I just don't see where the real opposition's coming from. The Democratic Party is so inept um, and so unclear about what they're about. I don't see it. I don't see how they're going to stop him. So you and me just have to stop him, I guess, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, you know, I hate to be so pessimistic, but I, I mean, I couldn't have dreamed just a few years ago this would have happened. So and it's happened so quickly and with such energy and fervor and momentum. It's like, wow. And they have the momentum too. Well, um, thank you so much for all of this. I, I'm going to read um, a quote from Scripture that uh, you, you share toward the end of the book that I think speaks really powerfully to what you were just sharing. Um, I'd like to just name a couple of announcements for our audience um, of up, upcoming events and how to particularly access this book. Um, and then I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us a closing prayer um, to finish out our um, time together today. It's been a great honor to, to have this. Um, in the toward the end of the book, you uh, quote from uh, from Mark. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written: "The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines." You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Mm. Uh, Really what you were just sharing, I think, evokes so compellingly those words of 
um, the hypocrisy and the dissonance um, that we see between the words that are being uh, spoken often and the actions that are being taken. Um, and I am grateful for this book. Uh, it's really spoken to me. Um, I know it is really speaking to many of us in F War. And thank you for so much for spending this time sharing with us about it and deep, getting deep into it. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, let us pray. Great God of the universe, great God of justice and love and mercy and reconciliation and community and common good, we ask that you guide and inspire and empower and inform us as to the path that we might take to make this society more just, more loving, to stay the evil hand that seeks to divide and to destroy. We ask that you lift up a righteous remnant who will stand on the wall and will hold back the hordes of, of anger and hatred, that we might build the kind of world, the kind of society in which our children's laughter is unencumbered and the, our old folk have security in the twilight of their days and in which we might all flourish with equity and equality and love in a setting in which everyone has access to the fruit of the tree of life. Bless us, guide us, empower us in the name of the one who came in God's name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, God brother. Bless everybody. God bless everybody. And like Tiny Tim said, God bless us, everyone, and let's 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 get to it. <laughs>